The international bestseller, The Da Vinci Code, owes its existence to a chance purchase made from a spinning stand outside a small provincial bookshop in central France over 35 years ago. The book was a small paperback called Le Trésor Maudit, The Accursed Treasure, and it was bought by a man called Henry Lincoln, pictured here outside that same bookshop in Vendôme in 1997. Back in 1969, Lincoln certainly didn't know that the book he was buying for a little light holiday reading was going to change his life. Le Trésor Maudit by Gérard de Sède told the story of a little-known village in the south of France, the now world-famous village of Rennes-le-Château. At the end of the 19th century, so the story went, the priest of this tiny hilltop village in the foothills of the Pyrenees discovered some parchments hidden in his church. Almost overnight, it seems, his life of extreme poverty changed to one of extraordinary wealth. The discovery of the parchments had apparently led him to a lost treasure, the accursed treasure of the title. His village and the tangible evidence of how he disposed of his wealth are there for all to see. The road up to the village, the decoration of the church, his Villa Britannia and its gardens, Belvedere and Tour Magdala were all built with his money. Where did it come from? The historical and mythical background to the Rene Chateau story has been fertile ground for researchers seeking to discover the source of Beranger Saunier's wealth. Over the last 30 years, that quest has spawned an industry Countless books, films, and documentaries have attempted to explain the mystery. The first and most influential of these was, of course, The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, the 1982 bestseller which Henry Lincoln wrote with Michael Bajant and Richard Lee. Drawing on a hypothesis developed in The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, Dan Brown's novel, The Da Vinci Code, has now introduced a whole new audience to the enigma surrounding Rennes-le-Château. But in the intervening years, Henry Lincoln has discovered another mystery, a mystery that goes far beyond the supposed treasure at Rennes-le-Château. The priest's riches are a distraction from the real secret of the village, that it is but a small part of a much greater wonder. It is, in fact, part of one of the wonders of the ancient world. This programme seeks to explain why this little-known area in the Languedoc region of France could truly be described as a holy place. In fact, the true mystery isn't confined to Rennes-le-Château, but has echoes elsewhere and is expressed in perfect form on a tiny island in the Baltic Sea. These discoveries at Rennes Chateau and on the Danish island of Bornholm are extraordinarily challenging, and they pose new questions about our ancient ancestors, their motivations, their skills, and their knowledge.
Over the last 30 years, Renne Chateau has transformed from a sleepy, remote mountaintop hamlet into a mecca for mystics, treasure hunters, new age thinkers and seekers after the truth. What draws people here from all over the world? And what do they expect to find here? Well, the story would still be just a little known local mystery and there would be no books, no films, no best-selling Da Vinci Code and no tourist trail if Henry Lincoln hadn't made a discovery that eventually took him far beyond the contents of that little red paperback, Le Trésor Maudit. In the summer of 1969, Lincoln, it seems, was the first to break a secret code. There I was, having read the way through the book, looking at the reproductions of two of the parchments which the priest had apparently found, and there it was, a passage from the Gospels in Latin, which talked of Jesus walking in the cornfields with the disciples, and they did rub the ears of corn and did eat. And suddenly I find myself reading off a message in French, very simple, it was hidden in a way that I've always described as a schoolboy code. Some of the letters were slightly raised above the others. When these were picked out, the hidden message was easily readable. It was so easy to find. And it simply said, this treasure belongs to Dagobah the second king and to Zion, and he is there dead. Nowhere in the rest of the book was there any reference to this decipherment. Was Lincoln the only person to have discovered this childishly simple code? Why hadn't the author mentioned it? For Lincoln, it was an incomplete solution. The book became his constant companion during the next months, the parchments providing hours of enjoyable distraction. But despite tantalising glimmers of other layers below the surface, he found nothing as clear as that first ringing message. However, the historical background to the story was fascinating. Rennes le Chateau is in the Languedoc, a region of France which is both overwhelmingly beautiful and blessed with many traces of its rich and turbulent past. It was here that the Qatar heresy took root, flourished, and was viciously suppressed by the Roman Church. In these mountains, the Knights Templar, proud warrior monks, established castles and commanderies. Arab invaders, Visigothic hordes, crusading armies, all passed this way. Behind the story of this 19th century priest and his discoveries, lay centuries of fanaticism, faith and suffering, a complex and bloody history which was almost unknown outside France. To Lincoln, a television scriptwriter, the subject seemed made for a TV documentary. At that time there was a series being done by the BBC called Chronicle, which dealt with subjects of historical and archaeological interest. And I thought it would be a good subject for them. So I took it to the producer and he agreed. Two years later, in 1972, the BBC Ed Lincoln's first television documentary. And that programme, The Lost Treasure of Jerusalem, which told the story of the priest Béranger Saunière and his little village of Rennes-le-Château, was the first that anybody outside France had ever heard of this extraordinary story. But it wasn't the last. The public reaction was so strong that in the decade that followed, Lincoln made two more films for the BBC, The Priest, The Painter and the Devil in 1975 and The Shadow of the Templars in 1979. By the time the third film was made, the research involved had become too much for one man. So Lincoln brought in two others to help, Richard Lee and Michael Bajant. 
And the three of us began to research in more depth and cover much more ground of what the story was all about. And that led eventually to the hypothesis, which we presented in a book published in 1982, and which was called The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail. Now, it seemed very much a case that that book touched a nerve back in 1982, part of the zeitgeist, if you like, and it created a huge reaction. It became a bestseller immediately. Uh, we were on the front pages right around the world. Because we had developed an hypothesis which appeared to explain all the background to this apparent treasure story. The book became as huge a publishing phenomenon as its fictional offspring, The Da Vinci Code, was to do some 20 years later. It was back in 1972, while he was making the initial BBC film, that Lincoln received the first hint that this was something more than just a treasure story. As part of his research, he travelled to Paris to meet Gérard de Sède, author of Le Trésor Maudit. One of the first questions I asked him was, why didn't you publish the hidden message in the parchments? And he said, what message? That struck me as being a very curious response, because I thought he must know it was there. And if he knew it was there, then he'd know that I knew it was there. So we fenced around this for a little while. And eventually we got to the point where we both knew that we were talking about the same message. So I repeated the question, why didn't you publish it? And he said, because we thought it might interest someone like you to find it for yourself. And that was an extraordinary response. I thought I was dealing with a simple little treasure hunt story in a set in a village. And yet suddenly there was a we in the background who thought it might be of interest to someone like me. There was something odd in the background and I could sense it from that moment on. It would be another seven years before Lincoln discovered the identity of that we in the background. It was the now infamous Priory of Zion. Lincoln's researches seem to suggest that the source of Berenger Sonia's wealth wasn't gold or treasure, but a secret. A secret of such significance that those protecting it would go to any lengths to safeguard its existence. All the clues, all the arcane twists and turns, the hidden codes, effaced tombstones, secret documents, paintings and statuary, the elements that sparked the imaginations of the BBC Chronicle audience through three films, suggested that there were people in the background who knew a great secret and were taking enormous pains to protect it. Yet at the same time, they seemed to be deliberately placing obscure hints to draw attention to its existence. Is the Priory of Zion a genuine secret society, an organisation hidden in the background and manipulating affairs? Well, there's no way of knowing. One of the key things about a secret society is that it's secret, and so we don't know what they know. All that we know is that an organisation surfaces in the 1950s, calling itself the Priory of Zion and lodging its statutes with the authorities in Anamas. So before that registration in the 1950s, we have no certainty about this organisation at all. We only have what the members of this organisation have chosen to tell us. And what they chose to tell, or rather infer, was that the Priory of Zion was protecting the bloodline of the Merovingian kings. Not only that, but its Grand Master, Pierre Plantard, 
was himself a descendant of that same bloodline. In France, this is akin to an Englishman claiming to be descended from King Arthur. Except that, of course, the Merovingian kings were an historical reality, not a myth. The claims of a crank, most likely. Except that there were corroborating documents, the dossier secret. Documents that had come to light in the Bibliothèque Nationale, documents showing a line of grandmasters of the Priory of Zion from the 12th century to the present day. Fake, surely. Except that when researched by Lincoln, Bajent and Lee, it was found that each of the seemingly unrelated names on that list was subtly connected in ways which would require a very deep knowledge of European history for anyone to manufacture. Nothing was ever straightforward, nothing could ever be proven, and yet a trail of tantalizing clues and convoluted pathways pointed to something being protected, something being preserved down through the ages. The need to verify the scenario hinted at by Plantard, the Bibliothèque Nationale documents, the parchments, and indeed the activities of the priest Berenger Saunier, led Lincoln, Bajent and Lee to an extended study of European history. This fresh approach unearthed new discoveries and unexpected connections. Chief amongst these was the suggestion that the Priory of Zion may have been responsible for the creation of that enigmatic order of warrior monks, the Knights Templar. And with any investigation of the Knights Templar, it's hard to avoid dealing with the popular notion of their association with the myth of the Holy Grail. And in the early Grail stories, the Templars were referred to as the guardians of the Grail and the Grail family. It was the protection of a family which led to the idea of a bloodline which gave us the dramatic hypothesis of a blood descent from Jesus and that Jesus, unlike the image we get from in the Gospels, was in fact married and that he was married to Mary Magdalene and she was the Grail. The Grail is, in most of our thinking, a cup or a chalice which supposedly either was used by Jesus at the Last Supper or at the crucifixion which caught the drops of his blood. But our hypothesis shifted it into another dimension. When we first encounter the Grail in the in the Grail stories. It's not a, a holy Grail, it's presented as a thing, one word, Sangral. S-A-N-G-R-A-A-L, Sangral. And because there was uh, a word like Graal, which meant cup or chalice, that one word was split into two, Sangral, holy chalice. And that's where that idea comes from. But if you break it one letter later, you have sang ral, which is royal blood. And so we have a bloodline, a blood descent. And with the thought of a marriage between Jesus and Mary Magdalene, the grail is now the womb of the Magdalene. She bears the blood of Jesus and creates the bloodline of their descent. And so the secret messages that the priest apparently had found began to make sense in a different context. This treasure belongs to Dagobert the second king and to Zion, and he is their dead. Are we talking about a blood descent Dagobert II, the last effective king of the Merovingian dynasty of France, and were they the blood descendants of Jesus? In 1982, that suggestion caused an outcry. 
the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, to quote the sleeve notes of a recent edition, sparked off a worldwide storm of controversy, reverberations of which are still resounding throughout the Western world. Over the years, public interest in the subject has remained strong. A steady procession of tourists and treasure hunters still make their way up to the remote hilltop of Rennes le Chateau in search of the truth, enlightenment, or Béranger Saunier's treasure. The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail has never been out of print, and countless other books and films on the subject have followed, some sensible, some not so. Debate about the authenticity of the Priory of Zion, to which we will return later, and a possible blood descent from Jesus became inextricably associated with the mystery of Rennes le Chateau. And we come to 2002, 20 years later, when a thriller is written called The Da Vinci Code, which picks up the hypothesis from our book and turns it into a thriller. Although the first character we meet in Dan Brown's novel, the curator of the Louvre Museum, is named Saunier after the real-life priest of Rennes le Chateau, the village itself doesn't feature in the story. Instead, we're treated to a breathless chase from France to Scotland, visiting four major historical locations on the way, the Louvre in Paris, the Temple Church and Westminster Abbey in London, and Rosslyn Chapel near Edinburgh. All these sites have experienced the benefits and the problems of vastly increased visitor numbers since the publication of the Da Vinci Code. But despite its absence from the novel, Rennes -le Chateau has also had its steady stream of tourists turned to a flood, as readers realise that the source of the Da Vinci Code theme lies here, in the foothills of the Pyrenees. Rennes le Chateau now receives over 100,000 visitors a year. The isolated village community that Henry Lincoln first visited over 30 years ago has changed. In 2004, five years after his last visit to Rennes le Chateau, Lincoln saw for himself the effect that the Da Vinci Code phenomenon was having on the village that he made famous. When I first discovered the story of Rennes le Chateau back in the late 60s, almost nobody had heard of the village, and outside France nobody at all had heard of it. The story just existed uh, as an account of 
a priest finding a treasure. So when I first stumbled onto it, the village was a little lost, remote peasant hamlet on the top of a mountain, peaceful. Now there's a place to park coaches. There are gift shops, bookshops, postcards, gifts. Rennes le Chateau is now a managed site. The church is only open at certain times. Visitors can no longer pay homage at the grave of Béranger Saunier. The cemetery is locked. Sonier's body has been exhumed and transferred to a new memorial in the presbytery garden. You have to pay to get in here. But there is still much to see and to muse over. There's a small museum in the presbytery. You can explore the ground floor of Sonia's Villa Botania. Walk along the Belvedere and climb his library tower, the Tor Magdala. The spectacular views remain unchanged. People come here for many reasons. But if they're hoping to find the Rennes le Chateau of Beranger Saunier, they're too late. And I have to say that I'm not very happy about what's happened, but then my opinion doesn't really matter. But I find it sad to see that it's attracted not just the treasure hunting lunatics, but also people who impose all sorts of other ideas and angles of approach onto what is essentially a story which is much more important than they seem to realize. Because there is another story to Rennes le Chateau, a story that few of the thousands of visitors are aware of. Obscured behind the tales of lost treasure, holy bloodlines, and elusive secret societies, beyond the thrills of the Da Vinci Code and the hypothesizing of the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, there lies an amazing fact. It's a fact whose existence was revealed through the work of a 16th century artist. But that artist wasn't Leonardo da Vinci. The countryside surrounding Beranger Saunier's village holds a secret, an astonishing work of man and nature, hidden to all but those who know how and where to look. Spread across the stunning landscape of the Ode Valley is what can only be described as one of the wonders of the world a vast and invisible temple of interlocking alignments and regular geometric forms defined by the precise positioning of churches, castles and ancient landmarks. Through all the myriad lines of investigation in this story, the priest's treasure, the Knights Templar, the Catars, the Merovingian kings, the Priory of Zion, the Holy Bloodline, one thing is certain, demonstrable, and provable. It is that Rennes le Chateau is part of an extraordinary, invisible phenomenon. The real treasure in this story is neither gold, nor silver and diamonds, nor even the Holy Grail.
At its simplest, it is a five-pointed star. A pentacle. And at one point, run le chateau. How did Henry Lincoln discover this phenomenon in the first place? And what is its significance? What questions does it force us to ask? Well, to begin to answer these questions and more, we need to retrace our steps. We need to return to the parchments. The parchments supposedly discovered by Beranger Saunier in 1891. In particular, the first parchment, the one that contains that enigmatic message, this treasure belongs to King Dagobert II and to Zion, and he is there dead. In preparation for the first BBC film in 1971, Lincoln spent much time contemplating the parchments. No matter where they came from, unquestionably they contain messages. But having dealt with those, I continued to look at them and there were lots of unanswered questions, even though we'd got the secret messages out of it. What we'd got were things like, why are there three crosses dotted amongst the text? The obvious question was, what happens if lines are drawn to connect the crosses? Well, that question is immediately rewarded as a line from this cross to this traces out a word from the intersected text. That word is Zion. So the right questions are being asked. What next? Drawing a line to the other cross doesn't produce a significant result. Yet the clear message from the first line is that the crosses are significant. What about the small triangular design in the upper left-hand corner? The upper face of this little triangle lines up with the cross on line 4, the lower face with the bottom of the first line. The connection of these two crosses produces this line. Inspired by a design which was said to have been inscribed on a stone found two miles from Renle Chateau, Lincoln played with the idea of a similar design being present in the parchment. There is no cross or mark to indicate the necessary line. But Lincoln was convinced that the creator of this parchment was playing a subtle game. He noticed that this A is oddly detached, the only isolated letter in the text, and that the exact midpoint of this line falls in that gap. The choice of this point is confirmed when a circle centred here not only naturally passes through these points on the triangle, but also passes through the cross in line 7. Choosing that point to create this line was further confirmed as correct when it's seen that the point created here is exactly equidistant from the first two crosses. The circle is indicated. And now the little design in the corner makes sense. The circle creates two more points of intersection, which, when joined, produce this. In 1971, when Henry Lincoln found this hidden pentacle, the story of Renle Chateau was still rooted in the mystery of a buried treasure. It didn't mean anything to me at the time when I found it. It's important to remember that I wasn't looking for anything specific I was merely asking myself, what is there? The second parchment is just as important in the whole story as the first. In 1971, Lincoln's interpretation of the message in the first parchment and a foray into the history of the area surrounding Renle Chateau had provided him with enough material for a short 20-minute film. Out of the blue, de Sed, who'd been in contact with Lincoln during the filming, now sent him a decipherment of this second parchment. The hidden message is in French. In English, it reads, Shepherdess, no temptation, 
that Poussin Tenier hold the key, piece 681, by the cross, and this horse of God I complete, this Damon guardian at midday blue apples. Utterly meaningless on the face of it. But there was one tenuous link to a part of the story that hitherto had seemed insignificant. In Le Trésor Maudit, de Serre had reported that Sonia had originally taken the parchments he found to Paris to be examined by experts. Before returning to his village, he'd visited the Louvre Museum, where he'd bought reproductions of three paintings, The Shepherds of Arcadia by Nicolas Poussin, one of Tenier's paintings of St. Anthony, and a portrait of Pope Celestine V. Here was a definite clue. Shepherdess, no temptation, that Poussin Tenier hold the key. Why had Sonia purchased paintings by the two artists mentioned in this decipherment? What was the link? At the time, it wasn't clear which painting by Tenier had been purchased by Sonia, but there is only one Shepherds of Arcadia, Les Bergers d'Arcadie by Nicolas Poussin. Three shepherds and a shepherdess looking at a tomb. In what I was told was a fictional landscape, an imaginary tomb in an imaginary landscape. Two of the shepherds point out the enigmatic phrase inscribed on the tomb, et in Arcadia ego. And with this phrase entering the tale, suddenly yet another part of the story began to make sense. This slab, now in the museum at Rennes Chateau, originally lay on the grave of Marie de Blanchefort, who died in 1781. It's said that Béranger Sonnier himself effaced the inscription on the gravestone, but originally it read thus. It too was reproduced in de Sede's book. The two outer columns looked simple enough, but their meaning had so far remained obscure. They appeared to be a combination of Latin and Greek, but only now, with the inscription on the Poussin tomb scene before him, did the penny drop for Lincoln. The message is in Latin, but it's only revealed when being seen as written in the Greek alphabet. When Lincoln transliterated the Greek symbols into the Roman alphabet, the two columns simply read, Et in Arcadia Ego. Curious enough, but also reproduced in Le Trésor Maudit, was a reproduction of the inscription on the headstone of Marie de Blanchefort's grave. And it's the oddities on this carving that provide the key to the incredibly complex decipherment of the second parchment and that give us the Poussin message. Already the simple story of a priest, some parchment and a mythical treasure seemed to be taking on a new dimension and depth. But then something else happened something that would elevate the story of Renault Chateau beyond the little 20-minute TV insert first intended. Some photographs arrived in the post, again sent by de Sede. The photographs were of a tomb nestling in a pastoral landscape. But what was stunning was that the scenes seemed to be identical to the one depicted in the 17th century painting by Nicolas Poussin. De said also revealed that the scene in the photograph was easy to find, a mere four miles along the road west from Rennes Chateau, near a village called Arc. It was quite an extraordinary moment to drive along the road and see it in reality. There are arguments, of course, about how old the structure is. There isn't any evidence for its age. The question of whether Poussin painted that tomb remains open. There is no question, though, that he painted the landscape. 
somebody could later have built the tomb to complete the picture. Or maybe it's been there for centuries. We just don't know. Having found the imaginary tomb in the imaginary landscape, which proved to be a real tomb in a real landscape, it's very sad to realize that, that tomb now no longer exists. It was destroyed by the owner of the land because he was sick and tired of people coming and trying to break it open to find their mythical treasure. But nothing can alter the landscape or the scene depicted by Poussin. Clearly this painting was important in the trail of clues which was now being uncovered. Did the Shepherds of Arcadia itself contain clues? Why had Beranger Saunier bought a copy of the painting from the Louvre? Could this canvas reveal the secret of Saunier's wealth? Did it indeed hold the key? Although Rune le Chateau, Blanchefort, Cardu and the Rock of Tustun are clearly represented in the painting. The skyline descends in the centre, whereas in reality it climbs higher. Lincoln wondered if Poussin had originally painted the rising hillside and then later decided to change it. The question was easily resolved by having the Louvre Museum provide an X-ray of the painting. Disappointingly, the radiogram didn't reveal a painted over hillside. But in studying the painting, Lincoln was becoming attuned to its details and he noticed an anomaly. In the X-ray, the underpainting beneath this shepherd's wreath is visible. And here it can be seen that the line of the tomb is painted on top of the staff. In other words, the shepherd's staff had been painted before the tomb. Lincoln thought it odd that a foreground item should be painted before its background. What was important about the staff that it should be placed first? Having had his attention drawn to the staff, he was curious to see what else could be said about it. Well, it's divided by the shepherd's arm. But more than that, it is precisely divided in two by the shepherd's arm. These two distances are exactly equal. And this is the same distance as this, and this, and this, and this. This seemed a significant discovery. The repetition of a fixed measure throughout the canvas suggested an underlying structure, where a seemingly relaxed and fluid depiction of a natural scene was in fact being dictated by rigid rules. Expert help was needed, and this was sought from Professor Christopher Cornford of the Royal College of Art, who'd made a particular study of the geometrical composition of paintings. He'd already analysed another work of Poussin's in this way, and he agreed to do the same with the Shepherds of Arcadia. The outcome of this study was startling. Startling to Cornford, because in this painting, Poussin had structured the image not only using a technique which, as expected, conformed to the presiding Renaissance philosophy, but he'd also simultaneously employed an archaic Masonic geometric system which had been known to the ancient Egyptians. This technique should not have been present in a 17th century painting, and yet here it was, a masterpiece based on an ancient and mystical form, the pentacle. Now, to say that Professor Cornford was surprised is a little bit of an understatement of what my reaction to it was, because suddenly again, this 
five-pointed star image had raised itself. I found it in the parchment and now here it was in the painting and it didn't seem to have any significance whatsoever. It was a long time later when researching other aspects of the story and asking other simple questions, why is the church dedicated to Mary Magdalene, that we discovered that Mary Magdalene was regarded as the medium of a secret revelation. And she had been given as her symbol in the heavens, the planet Venus. And now, curiously, we come back again to geometry because each planet, as it revolves in the heavens, creates alignments. There's only one planet which creates a regular figure in the heavens, and that planet is Venus, the Magdalene, and the design which she draws in the heavens is again a five-pointed star. Why? There was the crucial question. Why was the five-pointed star appearing again and again in this story? What possible significance could it have? Professor Cornford knew that Lincoln was seeking the answer to a puzzle and was aware of some of the background to the story. In concluding his report on the painting, he made the following unexpected suggestion. Would it be worthwhile testing the map for the presence of pentagonal angles and vectors? Look for geometry in the landscape. It wasn't very easy to know what exactly one should be looking for. Looking for a pentagon in the landscape didn't seem to be a very simple thing to do, but it occurred to me that a pentacle was made up of five overlapping triangles, and I wondered if a triangle, which after all has only three points, might be easier to find than five points. And what three points could there be associated with the story? And that's when I realised there were, in fact, three castles associated with the story. There was the castle at Le Le Chateau, there was the Templar castle at Bezu, and there was also the castle built by Bertrand de Blanchefort, who was fourth Grand Master of the Knights Templar. So I looked at the three castles on the map, and each one was on a natural mountain peak. There they were clearly marked on the map. And when I drew the triangle and measured the angles, I found that in fact I was looking at what one could call a pentagonal triangle. It was exactly that triangle with angles of 36 degrees and 72 degrees that made up a pentagon. The obvious next step was to look for the other two points of the pentagon and then to find that they were already marked on the map, not with castles, this time with spot heights marked on the map. What I had was five natural mountain peaks in perfect pentagonal geometry. Now that was extraordinary. The parchments, the painting of the tomb near Renle Chateau, the occult relationship of the Magdalene to the planet Venus, and now a perfect pentacle described by the landscape itself. The next thought, the significance of that geometric shape. After all, it doesn't matter if we, with our 21st century scepticism, adopt the attitude, well, so what? It's just coincidence. What does it matter? If this was noticed in the past, and remember, 
We must look at this story in the way that our ancestors looked at it and not the way that we look at it. For them, that would have been a staggering, God-given geometry. In the third of the BBC films made four years later, Lincoln was able to explore that idea. The Shadow of the Templars, the last of Lincoln's BBC films, was broadcast in 1979. And David Wood, one of the viewers of that programme, who was a skilled and trained cartographer, was intrigued by the idea and he, knowing about cartography, looked at it and in his own way then found additional geometry. As already mentioned, one of the main source documents that supposedly helped to establish the credentials of the Priory of Zion was the Dossier Secret, an assortment of papers deposited in the Bibliothèque Nationale during the late 1950s. Many other obscure pamphlets and papers relating to the Renishatu story were deposited around the same time, and among these was a small booklet called Le Serpent Rouge. Following a line of clues he detected in the text of this work, David Wood examined the sunrise line, as seen from Renault Chateau on the 22nd of July, feast day of Mary Magdalene. It was said that on that day the sun is seen to rise directly over Blanchefort. When he drew this line on the map, Wood found that it passed precisely through the church in the village of Arc. A line in the Serpent Rouge reads, on his white rock, looking beyond the black rock towards the south. Blanchefort means white fort, and on the same mountain, towards the south, is Roca Negra, black rock. Extending a line from Blanchefort to Roca Negra, Wood found it struck the church at Rennes-les-Bains precisely. What's more, this line sits at an exact 90 degrees to the sunrise line. Another line in the Serpent Rouge reads, find the line of the meridian in going from east to west. The Paris meridian, which was only replaced by the Greenwich meridian in 1884, passes Wood's sunrise line between Blanchefort and Arc. The angle between these two lines is 72 degrees, the base angle of a pentagram. Again following clues in the booklet, Wood measured the distance between Arc and Rennes le Chateau and divided it into six. The second division from Arc along the sunrise line fell exactly on the Paris meridian. And he saw that the distance from Roca Negra to Rennes les Bains was identical to one of these divisions. The Poussin tomb is here. Knowing the importance in the story of the tomb, Wood looked for a possible connection with the structure that was emerging. He drew a line from the tomb through the intersection of the meridian and the sunrise line and discovered that it too hit Renéban church. Wood's next move may have been a lucky guess. But seeing that the church at René Bain was significant to the design, he sought a reiteration of the distance to Roca Negra along this latest line and marked it off. His trained eye then spotted something extraordinary. To confirm what he seemed to be seeing, he traced a circle round this point using the distance to René Chateau as the radius measure. This circumference exactly marks off the castle of Custosa, Serra Castle, the point of intersection of the Paris Meridian and the Sunrise Line, Le Toustun, the prominent outcrop that can be seen in Poussin's painting, the church at Bougarache, and the church of Saint Just le Bezou. but Wood was on the hunt for a pentacle. Marking off the essential 36 degree angles within the circle, 
produce this. An astounding discovery. For David Wood, this was the start of a line of inquiry that would eventually result in the publication of his own book, Genesis, in 1985. From my point of view, when David Wood contacted me and told me that he had this additional level of geometry, was the first indication that I had had that there was anything beyond the five mountains. And I realized that his discovery left to one side that original discovery, my pentacle of mountains, which had led him to it. I realized that I had to put the two together. And as soon as I put the two together, I realized that they were interlocked and that the whole thing was much bigger than he had expected. In fact, the whole phenomenon was much bigger than even Lincoln expected. For Renner Chateau wasn't the only place to be revealing its geometric secrets. 1,000 miles away, on the tiny Danish island of Bornholm in the Baltic Sea, a journalist and filmmaker named Erling Hågensen had become intrigued by the unusual round churches which are found there. Uh, well, you see, I am, I am born at Borholm, and I had spent some time uh, in Copenhagen uh, studying at the university. I've always been interested in the connection between uh, science and religion. There used to be a connection. There isn't that very much anymore. And uh, coming back to Bornholm, uh, made me interested in the medieval churches in this island. And I thought, since there are four round churches on this little, actually squared island, it might not be totally stupid to think that there could be an overall plan placing these uh, four round churches. Since they are so geometrical in their shapes, they have square towers and everything. So there is a lot of also symbolic things connected to the architectural ge geometry in these churches. Ustelos, Olska, Nika, and Nulos. Four completely unique round churches amongst the 15 churches that serve the community of Bornholm. So I thought there might be the possibility that uh, there were an overall idea in placing them. And I looked at that, and at the first glance there isn't anything, not at all. Then I discovered that, um, well, when you have four churches, you don't have that very many lines to draw between them, so there are a limited number of lines that you can look into. And the interesting part of that was that two of these lines formed a very accurate 30-degree angle. The 30-degree angle is part of the formation of a regular six-sided star. Could this small hint be indicating the presence of hexagonal geometry? The controlling feature of sacred geometry is the circle. If a circle could be found, then maybe that could be the key to revealing any underlying pattern. The largest of the round churches is Ustelos. Using this as a center, Hogginson tentatively marked out a circle on the map using the distance from Ursulas to Nulas as the radius. This immediately produced a fascinating result. Exactly on the same circumference is the Church of Rutska. Well, this could, of course, be a coincidence. But then there is a particular aspect of Erling Hogginson's investigations that significantly reduce that chance. It just so happens that the official Danish Institute for Map Production have used the spires of the 15 churches on Bornholm as trig points. This means that the exact coordinates of the churches had already been meticulously calculated. The relative positions of the churches had been pinpointed to the millimeter. Already, Hogginson was able to say that not only did a circle drawn on a map hit on these two points, but that the distance from Ustelas to Nulas was 
335.585 meters, and the distance from Ustalas to Ruska was 14,335.71 meters. That's a difference of no more than 12 centimeters, or just under four and three quarter inches, over a distance of about nine miles. And then when I had established how that geometrical relation was, then I discovered that there was also another one connected to that geometry. And then there was another one. And then there was another one. And it's like grabbing a carpet and you draw in one corner and everything sort of follows. Meanwhile, Henry Lincoln was also discovering that there was more to the geometry of Renner Chateau than he'd thought. Seeing that his original pentacle of mountains and David Wood's pentacle of churches were not unconnected patterns, but were in fact exquisitely locked together, Lincoln began to look further. An amazing picture began to take shape. Extensions to and validations of the original pentacle abounded. Castles, churches and other landmarks lined up in abundance to confirm the existence of a deliberately structured landscape hidden in the Ode Valley. Could it be coincidence? Yes, that is absolutely true. Um, the sort of people who approach it in this way seem to think that I don't realise that. Of course you can develop geometric designs if you just join points. There is a distinct difference with the geometry which we have at Rennes -le Chateau. The distance from one point of the Pentacle of Mountains to the opposite intersection is two miles, 1,618 yards. The distance from Rennes -le Chateau Church to Rennes Ban Church is two miles, 1,618 yards. From Rennes -le Chateau Church to the Church of Compagnie sur Aude is the same, as is the distance from the churches of Antignac and Roc Tayard, Cru and Bourriège. It is the radius of David Wood's circle of churches. In fact, it's the distance between all these significant points in the area. But earlier, David Wood had found another measure which governed his pentacle of churches. The measure that the sunrise line divided six times into, that was half the distance from Arc to the intersection of the Paris Meridian line, that was the same distance from Rocca Negra to the church at René Bain, that defined the position of the centre of his circle of churches, was a precise and known measure. David Wood was the first to stumble on it, and I don't know that he saw any significance in it. He certainly doesn't seem to have talked about any significance in the fact that the unit of measure was the English mile. Amazingly, the English statute mile is present everywhere within the geometry of Rennes -le Chateau. All these distances between significant points are exact numbers of miles and half divisions of a mile. I don't sit down and set out to look for something. I look to see what is there, and I keep an open mind. An open mind is a precious gift, and it's something that I do try to adhere to. Pentacle of mountains, sacred landscape geometry, and now fixed measures, the church circle and the mile. Extraordinary discoveries, which Lincoln published in his book, The Holy Place, in 1991. Coincidence had built upon coincidence upon coincidence, until another explanation besides chance must be sought. But what explanation is there?
One inescapable suggestion is that some people in the distant past may have had a far deeper knowledge and a far higher level of surveying skill than we in our modern age are prepared to give them credit for. But why express that knowledge in this way? What could be the possible purpose of creating such an enormous work that is on the one hand magnificent in its achievement and on the other invisible to all but those who know where and how to look? The context of the discovery doesn't help in the search to find an answer. A story in a cheap paperback a priest who becomes mysteriously rich, parchments of uncertain provenance, a secret society of dubious origin, a 17th century painting. Nothing in the trail that led to the discovery helps to explain or validate the discovery. There is, however, one presence always in the background of this story which cannot be ignored. an historically real and ancient organization that at one time had money, power, influence, and it said, sacred knowledge. One thousand miles away on Bornholm, Erling Hoganson was detecting their presence too. Historically, round churches have always been associated with the Knights Templar. And in the 12th century, at the time they were built, Denmark's links with the order were surprisingly strong. The Danish Archbishop of Lund between 1137 and 1177 was Eskil. He was a good friend of Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, who was the protector, protector for the Templars. And uh, the, giant, the grand chapter of the Templars were in Clairvaux at the time where Eskil were down there for seven years. He was actually down there for many, in many occasions. And he spent seven years down there uh, at the time where we can see from historical records that they actually made plans for the uh, Crusades in Baltic. Uh, and Templars, of course, and Crusades, they are closely connected. In particular, when we talk about supply, supply for, for, a, for a fleet, which was, this, this crusade had to do with conquering the um, Baltic countries there, the Estland, uh, Lettland and Lithuania. And Denmark was in charge of that, or became in charge of that, um, after this uh, meeting in, in Clairvaux together with Eskil and, and the Pope Alexander III. So we can see there is a very, very close connection uh, to uh, that area which actually is the heart of the of the Templars at the time. Yeah, well, when I first um, uh, had the thought that there could be a Templar link between Bornholm uh, and this knowledge, I thought about um, that if the Templar were involved and had done these churches and had then connected that with geometry, it was not unlikely that I could have done something like that somewhere else. And uh, then I remembered the television program that Henry made and thought that uh, there might be a good possibility that they have done it down there in the area of Renner Chateau. And I thought I, I would contact uh, Henry Lincoln and uh, tell him that. So I... I contacted him, I called his agent, and eventually the agent had talked to Henry, and, and we talked then over the phone, and uh, I said to him, I think if you look down there at the churches, you might find that they are connected in a geometrical pattern. And there was a pause, and then he said, did you read my book? And I said, yes, because at that time, I had with great interest read the Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and I thought that was what he meant. But then it turned out he didn't mean that one. He meant another one that he has just recently published, 
a book that was at that week going to be published in France uh, called um, uh, The Holy Place. It was the Knights Templar that seemed to tie together the geometry of Rennes Chateau and the geometry of Bornholm. The two lines of research were drawn into one when Lincoln and Hoganson began to work together. Their collaboration produced a series for television in 1992, which was broadcast as The Secret of the Templars, and in 2000 their book, The Templars' Secret Island, was published. The authors explored the idea that the Knights Templar had been protecting a secret knowledge obtained in the Holy Land, and that for some reason in the 12th century, they sought to express or preserve that knowledge in the landscape of Bornholm and Renner Chateau. Lincoln and Hoganson were also able to demonstrate the exquisite detail of the geometry on Bornholm and show not only the incredible accuracy of the positioning of the churches, but also that the geometry itself is both elegant and purposeful. Incredibly, the Bornholm geometry contains solutions to ancient mathematical problems. An amazingly accurate method for calculation of circumference without using pi. The trisection of the angle, a mathematical problem that's exercised the greatest of minds for centuries, solved with incredible accuracy on the island of Bornholm. And again, there's that anachronistic presence of a fixed measure, the mile, a standard that wasn't supposed to have been established until 1593. Does the geometry of Bornholm and Renner Chateau have something to teach us about our units of measure? We know that in the 18th century, the metre was defined scientifically as being one ten millionth of a quadrant of the Earth's circumference, the distance from the pole to the equator. It follows, therefore, that the polar circumference of the Earth should be 40 million metres. In fact, a small error was made at the time of calculation, and the actual circumference turns out to be 7,467 metres longer. What's astonishing is that there is a far more accurate relationship between the measurement of the circumference of the Earth and the mile than there is between that measurement and the modern metre. Along with the familiar yard and foot measures, there's another, often forgotten unit, the pole. 320 poles make one mile. One pole equals 198 inches. Take a closer look at these measures and you find a fascinating correlation. The diameter of a circle which has a circumference of one pole is exactly 63 inches. If you multiply this distance by 25 million, you reach a far closer approximation to the circumference of the Earth. 40,000,305 metres. Moreover, the easy division of 5 into this number suggests a measurement made in antiquity based on a pentagonal division of the Earth's circumference. It would take several programmes to analyse the fine relationship between ancient and modern measure. However, investigating the measurement of the Earth provides conclusive evidence that the geometry on Bornholm was deliberately constructed. Although the positioning of these churches appears to be incredibly accurate, in some instances there is slight variation from theoretical perfection. Some of these anomalies have straightforward explanations. For instance, the Church of Vesta Marie stands 21 metres northwest of its predicted position in the geometry. But this church was rebuilt in the 1880s, and it can be seen from the architect's drawings that the altar of the old church was in exactly the right place to conform to the pattern. The Bornholm geometry contains a great five-pointed star. Curiously, the eastern tip of this star doesn't fall on the church of Bodilska, as it should in theory, but on the adjoining tower, precisely on this enigmatic and otherwise inexplicable stone on the southeastern face. The placement of the church at Olska was a more puzzling inaccuracy. Olska is not in the right place, 
Olska is 223 feet and 11 inches from its theoretical position. The breakthrough here came when Hogginson began to look at the relationship of the Bornholm placements to the Earth's axis. The geometry not only has its own internal logic, but also the whole structure aligns perfectly with the four cardinal points. When the position of Olska is calculated using the geometry of a curved surface, i.e. the surface of the Earth, as opposed to a flat map surface, it was found that the proper geometric position for Olska is only 11 feet 9 inches from its actual center. The whole of the Bornholm geometry is demonstrating not only the incredible skill of its constructors, but is evidence that they had an advanced and sophisticated knowledge of the curvature of the Earth and the means to measure it and place buildings upon it with incredible precision. And then, of course, you could wonder if it was at all possible at, at, at those times to make anything like that, anything that accurate. Uh, and the answer is that uh, it very well might have been because we can see that exactly down in that area of, uh, of um, Clairvaux uh, and contemporary with Bernard of Clairvaux, there is a, a mathematician who, who gives lecture to his students and his notes uh, have survived, survived. And we can see uh, how he explains uh, how one do this kind of measurement. It's very fascinating to see that our um, forefathers had uh, capabilities that we maybe normally don't think they had. It, it, I mean, when you talk to people in general, they will tend to say that uh, in the medieval time, people believed the earth was flat. Now, if you if you read these uh, lectures that uh, Hugo Sack Victor was giving, you can see that they have a much much more advanced knowledge. He described the the the, the sphere of the Earth very clearly to his uh, pupils, and also describes how it's possible to measure it and all that. And and from that, he takes actually uh, basic in a measurement done that much longer back from his time than he is from our time. So you so you can see that this knowledge goes far, far, far back in time. The geometry alone indicates the sophistication of the 12th century architects. But the churches hinted even more concealed purpose and design. The conical roofs are a relatively recent addition. Originally, the four round churches would have looked like this, with tiered ramparts. The generally accepted interpretation of the design is that they are defensive structures. But if the churches did have a defensive function, then their positions in the landscape were poorly chosen. These openings, sometimes described as arrow slits, are impractical. They'd be useless for that purpose in the event of an attack. So what could their true purpose be? Well, it can be shown that the slits and holes in the inner and outer rotundas of Erstelas, at least, are designed to observe the rising and setting of the sun at the summer and winter solstices. All the round churches have this inner and outer rotunda and alignment of two gaps in the wall at this distance apart provides a very accurate way of defining particular points on the horizon. The evidence suggests that the churches of Bornholm could be a network of calendrical observatories joined together by a precise geometry that is in turn locked into the curvature and division of the surface of the Earth. However overwhelming the evidence may be, it's still tempting to put it all down to chance. <laughs> uh, there have, have, of course, been that argument that all this is due to coincidence. Um, and um, that's an argument that comes up when they realize that it is there. All this accuracy is there. Everything is there. They can't deny that. So the next thing is, but they weren't able to do that. They couldn't do that. So therefore, it has to be coincidence. This is the main argument. This is the way around they talk. 
And that is the same thing then you could say about the pyramids, because they couldn't do that. So therefore, it's due to coincidence. The pyramid is due to pure coincidence. It's a pure coincidence that they could orientate it to, to north uh, within three seconds of a degree, and all that, that we can see that they actually did. Coincidence. Of course, it can't be. Too many apparently intelligent people have been distracted from this material because certain people who should be more careful about what they say have implied that this is pure fantasy and coincidence. If it were, I wouldn't still be wasting my time with it. So I think eventually people will have to realize, and in particular the, the, um, the academic circles will have to realize that here is something that they have to consider and that is there and that it is not coincidence and then they will have to come up with an explanation. This is why it's particularly frustrating to find that there are people who still wish to rush around saying, oh, it's all fantasy, it's just pure imagination, it isn't there at all. What they're doing is wasting time. They're denying solid and demonstrable facts because those solid and demonstrable facts run counter to what such people have been taught and which they continue to teach. We're saying, no, you've got it all wrong. But this time we have proofs. So it must be looked at seriously. This knowledge is here at the Earth at this time and had been here actually for even thousands of years before that. And we know that. So it's just a question of finding a link between Bornholm to this, uh, to, this, to this knowledge. All I've done is open the door. It's for people who have the expertise, who can understand what's here, who now have got the work to do. But the background to this story, the question of why this mystery is set, where it's set, in the little village of Rennes Chateau in the south of France and on the island of Bornholm in the Baltic Sea. These aspects of the story don't rely on hypotheses. They are pure statements of fact. What we have uncovered is a vast body of lost knowledge Medieval observatories and the measurement of the circumference of the Earth seem far removed from parchments, secret societies, hidden treasure and the Holy Grail. The path of discovery has been long and the clues have often been distracting. We've travelled quite a distance from Dan Brown's novel, a thriller that begins with the brutal murder of a man named Sonnier. Did the real Béranger Saunier find a treasure? Is the Priory of Zion real? Did Mary Magdalene carry the bloodline of Christ to France two millennia ago? Perhaps we in turn need to murder the mystery of Béranger Saunier in order to get at the truth. We should stop wasting time 